sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're excited that you're joining in with us this week for worship. And if you're watching from across Four Corners, Florida, we invite you to come out and be with us every Sunday morning in the gymnasium of Citrus Ridge Academy. You can find it at 1775 Sand Mine Road in Davenport, just off of Highway 27. We look forward to seeing you there. Each week when we begin our online worship service, we start out by singing a song and join in with us as we sing about the great things God is doing. God, we thank you and we worship you. God, we stand amazed by you and your goodness and what you're doing in our lives. And God, I pray now as we look into your word that you would speak to our hearts. Cause your truth to come alive in us. Help us to be doers of your word, not just hearers only. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Well, welcome to our final week, week number seven in our series where we've been looking at the seven churches of Revelation. This week we're going to be looking at the church of Laodicea. Now let's begin just like we have every week by reading the last verse first, which happens to be the same in all seven letters. Revelation 3.22 says this, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. We need, we need to always remember and never forget that it's God the Holy Spirit who takes the things of God and makes them known 
to us. He's the one who takes our theology and turns it into reality in our lives. So we should never look into the Word of God without asking Him to speak to us and to illuminate the truth of God found in the living Word. So anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He is saying to the churches. Now to back up and go to the first part, and this is John, the beloved, the disciple John, who is writing this letter. He's, he's taking dictation from Jesus and writing this letter. He's on the Isle of Patmos. It's a prisoner island. They've tried to get him away from society. And God had a special plan for John. And that's the book of Revelation, the entire book that God revealed to John on the Isle of Patmos. But in this last letter to the church of Laodicea, in Revelation 3.14, it says, Write this letter to the angel. And again, I remind you that it's not talking about an angelic being. It's talking about a messenger. The one carrying the letter or delivering the message to the people. All right? So we can look at it as being the pastor of the church in Laodicea. Write this letter to the angel of the church. And again, I mean, I, I pray that you will remember this even far beyond this series, even though other parts of this series will fade from your mind. I hope you always remember that every time you see the word church in the New Testament, it's not talking about a building. It's not talking about a service or a gathering. It's talking about people. That word church is a compound Greek word. And it is out of and to call. We turned it around to find out that it means the called out ones. As followers of Christ, we've been called out. We've been called out of some things, but we've been called into some things, right? We've been called out of spiritual death and we've been called into everlasting life. We've been called out of the shame and guilt and condemnation of sin. And we've been called into the joy and freedom of Christ's righteousness. We've been called out of a life of darkness into the light of the gospel. We've been called out of selfishness and self-centeredness. We've been called into a life of purpose and surrender. We've been called out of being of this world into being of the kingdom of God and of the family of God. We've been called out of being in sin or being immersed in sin into being in Christ, immersed in Christ. We've been called out to be called in and we are the called out ones. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Laodicea. We've been looking at the historical city from writings and and history. We've been finding out things about the city and those things come into play with the letter that Jesus is sending to the actual believers at the actual time, even though God's word is ageless and timeless and it speaks across all times and cultures. There are some specific things that have to do with what was going on in these people's everyday lives. So Laodicea. It was founded by Antiochus II in 260 BC, and he named the city after his wife, Laodice, I guess is how you pronounce her name. And now the Romans took over the city in 129 BC, and they made it a free city. However, it was destroyed by an earthquake in 60 AD. Now, Laodicea was so prosperous that even after they were, they were destroyed by the earthquake, Rome wanted to come in and help them rebuild the city. But Laodicea was so prosperous that they refused help from Rome to rebuild the city. Now, in Laodicea, there was a large Jewish population. And at this time, approximately 7,500 Jews lived in Laodicea. And when you were a Jew, even if you moved away from Jerusalem, you would still send an offering or a temple tax to the temple in Jerusalem each year. And the Jews in Laodicea were so prosperous, 
every year they sent over 20 pounds of gold to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, Laodicea was a very popular place, much like the area that we live in, right? It's a very popular place. People go there to retire. And during this time in Laodicea, it was the, it was the place for wealthy people to go and retire towards the end of their lives. Now, Laodicea was known for several things, just like each of the other cities. It was known for an eye salve. Now, if you ever had a problem with your eye and you wanted something to help it, you would get the Laodicean eye salve. They were also known for their black wool garments. They were known for their banking. All of this in Laodicea. Now, the Talmud, which is a Jewish writing, a Jewish historical writing, lets us know this. We get a look into Laodicea because it's mentioned in the Talmud. And it said the Jews in Laodicea, they were living a life of ease and leisure. So again, this was a very prosperous town. Now, from this point, finding out that this letter is to the called out ones in Laodicea. Well, now we get into the introduction, the introduction of the author. And we know that Jesus is the author of all seven letters to the seven different churches. But he always introduces himself in a different way, with different descriptions of who he is. And in Revelation 3.14, it says, This is a message from the one who is the Amen. And Jesus describes himself as the Amen. That word Amen, amen means, yes, so be it. In Isaiah 65, verse 16, it tells us that God is the God of amen. He is the God of truth. Amen affirms the truthfulness of what is being said. Corinthians 1.20 says this, All the promises of God are yes and amen. All the promises of God are yes and amen. They are truthful. They're truthful. What's being said is truthful. So Jesus describes himself as the amen. So how do we translate that? Well, Jesus is the living verification and the confirmation of the promises of God. Let me say that again. Jesus is the amen. That means he is the living verification and confirmation of everything God said of all of his promises. They are yes and amen. They're not maybe. They're yes and amen. This is a message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, which just goes along with Jesus saying he is the amen. He is, he is faithful and he's true. All right? He's saying this, what I'm, what I'm saying Every time I say something, every time Jesus says something, every time God says something, it's the truth. There's, there's no need to deny it because it's the truth. There's no need to try to explain it away like some people do because it's the truth. There's no need to make excuses to get around it being the truth because it is the truth. Jesus is the amen. What God says, what God's word says it is the truth. That's not up for debate. Back to verse 14. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of God's new creation. Well, we find out in John that, that nothing was made without Jesus making it, but also this new creation the, of being born again, new. It's like the old is gone and we are made new in Christ. We are a new creature, a new creation. And Jesus is the beginning of God's earthly creation, the, the cosmic creation that we know of today and the new creation of the called out ones. All right. Jesus is the source. He's the source of both. Jesus is the source. Now, in each letter, Jesus has followed his introduction 
with words of encouragement. And then, as we looked at last week, four of the letters had challenged. Two of them were just encouragement. But so far, everybody has received some encouragement, and four of the churches have received challenge. So that's what we're expecting, right? Well, <laughs> we're not going to find any encouragement in this last letter to the church of Laodicea. Jesus says in Revelation 3.15, He says, I know all the things you do. There it is again. He knows. Jesus knows. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows what the believers, the called out ones in Laodicea, He knows what they're doing. He knows the motivation behind what they're doing. All right? But He knows that about everyone, everywhere. He says, I know all the things you do. And listen to what He says, that you are neither cold nor hot. And then He says, I wish that you were one or the other, cold or hot, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither cold or hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, sorry, Laodicea. <laughs> That's not very encouraging words. Jesus says, you're not cold or hot, and because you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, we have to learn something else about Laodicea to understand how the people received what Jesus was saying. There was a city named Aeropolis. It was about five miles away. And there were therapeutic hot springs in Aeropolis. So the people from Laodicea would go to Aeropolis and go to the hot springs. Well, they were so affluent and had so much in resources that the people of Laodicea had this big idea. They said, let's build a pipeline from Aeropolis. Let's take large limestones and let's, let's, you know, make a tube down the middle of them and let's stack them up all together and seal them off and let's, let's bring running hot water, therapeutic hot spring water to Laodicea so we don't have to keep traveling there. Okay, so they did it. Let me tell you what else. In Colossae, it was a little bit farther than Aeropolis. It was about 10 miles away. Now, in Colossae, they had pure, refreshing, cold streams. Some of the best drinking water that anywhere in that area had ever drank. Well, it's 10 miles away, so Laodicea, you know, they'd have water brought in. Well, no, we're going to do the same thing we did with Aeropolis. We're going to we're going to build a pipeline. As a matter of fact, we have so much resources that we're going to build two pipelines, one to Aeropolis and one to Colossae, and we're going to have pure, refreshing, cold spring water, and we're going to have hot, therapeutic water. So we're going to have hot water, we're going to have cold water, but here's the reality. As soon as those pipelines were built and they started running water through them, by the time water traveled five miles above ground in a rock pipeline, and, or 10 miles above ground in a rock pipeline, guess what? The cold water wasn't cold and the hot water wasn't hot. Coming out of both sides was lukewarm water. Also, coming out of both sides. After traveling through these, these stones, they had picked up so many minerals and so many things that contaminated the water. The water was lukewarm and the water was contaminated. And if you go there today and look at what this water used to flow through, there's so much deposits around where the tubes were that it's, it's almost closed up. There was so much contamination in their pipelines. And as a result, you, you really had to acquire a taste for the contaminated lukewarm water in Laodicea. They had spent so much to try to get that therapeutic hot spring water and that, that cold, cool, pure stream water. And then it turns out 
that all that they had coming out of both pipelines were contaminated, lukewarm water. Now, I've been to places where there have been contaminated water. As, as me and my family spent 20 years on the road, we would almost every year we went to a, a small church in Kennedy, South Carolina, and they had well water at the church. But the depth of the well water, I mean, and even in the homes of the community, there was so much sulfur in the ground that when you got in the shower to take a shower and you turn it on, it took your breath because it smelled like rotten eggs. Also, we went to an, an area in New York, Jamestown, New York, in Western New York, and they had a well at the church and, and there was so much iron in the water that it would turn the pipes. It would, it would make a white water line pipe look like it was rusty. I'll never forget, we they had a pet fish, you know, a beta fish that we carried with us, and we changed the water while we were there, and the fish died within a few hours. There was so much metal and iron in the water, in the well water. So I know what it's like to have contaminated water, but that's the way it was in Laodicea. It was supposed to be cold or hot, but it was lukewarm and contaminated. And when Jesus said, I wish that you were cold or hot, but you're just lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. They knew exactly what the comparison was. It was comparing their grand idea of piping in the hot water and cold water from those nearby cities. Now, here's the question that we probably need to ask ourselves when it comes along with this. I mean, are we hot? Are we on fire for God? Are we cold? Or are we lukewarm? What would it be to be cold? Well, see, why, I've, I've always thought about this. Why would Jesus say, I wish that you were hot or cold? See, here's what I've discovered. It's easier for somebody who is cold to come into a relationship with Christ than than it is for somebody who has, they think that they're good, they think that they have a relationship with God, but they really don't because it's through some other person or through the way they grew up or, or whatever. And they think that that makes them good. So they don't need God and the things of God. And they don't need to worship together with other believers because they're just good, right? See, you would call them lukewarm people. You would call the people that are, going after a, a living relationship with a living God, you would call them cold, you would call them hot people, call them hot, on fire for God. And then the people who are just completely indifferent would be cold. And it's a whole lot easier to show someone who is indifferent their need for Christ than somebody who thinks that they're just okay where they are. Somebody who is lukewarm and not really in a real relationship with the living God. And by looking at people's lives, you can, you can tell what somebody believes by the way they live. I mean, right? You, you can't find out what a person really believes just by listening to them talk. Because there's a lot of people who have a lot of great answers. But you can tell what they really believe by the way they actually live. Let's continue. Jesus continues talking to the called out ones in Laodicea in Revelation 3.17. He says this. He says, you say I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. Remember, Laodicea is a very affluent, Laodicea is a very affluent city. They didn't even ask Rome for help to rebuild the city after the earthquake. They thought they had everything. And Jesus says, look, I know, I know the way you're living. You say, you say that you're rich. You have everything you want. You don't need a thing. But Jesus says this. He says, you say you're rich. You have everything you want. You don't need a thing. And then Jesus says, you don't realize that you're wretched, miserable, poor, naked, and blind. You you don't realize that. See, they refused the help of Rome. 
They thought they had everything they need. And in their self-sufficiency, they actually were at a point where they don't need God either. Now, don't get me wrong. They would have never said out of their mouth that they don't need God. But that's the way they lived. They went through the motions, went through the religious motions like they don't need God. I've heard this question asked through the years where people ask this question, and it's a thought-provoking question, and it goes like this. If, if God, if Jesus did not show up to church Sunday, if the Holy Spirit did not show up at your gathering, at your worship service this Sunday, would he be missed? Or is everything just completely programmed out to the point where it's going to happen like it's going to happen whether God is there or not? And it's hard to believe that that's a possibility. But if we're honest, we could say that it is a possibility that we could go through all the religious motions of having a worship service without ever worshiping God, without ever really lifting up the name of Jesus. We could just go through the motions, whether he's with us or empowering us or anointing us or not. And that's a scary place. And I would call that a place of being lukewarm too. Jesus said, look, you got to realize. You think you are rich and you have everything you want, that you don't need a thing. And Jesus is saying, look, you got to realize that you need me. <laughs> he says, look, you don't realize that you're wretched, that you're miserable, that you're poor, that you're blind, that you're naked. And see, he was hitting all of the things of Laodicea. He said that they're poor. They say that they're rich. Jesus is saying you might be rich materially, but you're poor spiritually. Laodicea was the place to purchase eye salve if you had a problem with your eyes. And Jesus says, look, you might think that you've got everything figured out and you've got this eye salve that everybody wants in the whole region, but really, you are blind. You might think that you're helping people see, but you're blind. They made the finest wool, black wool clothing. The finest clothes came from Laodicea. And Jesus says, don't you realize that you're naked? I mean, you, you're proud of all these things, the, the affluence, the eyes have, the finest clothes. But really, spiritually, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. And then Jesus goes on in verse 18 to say this. So let me give you some advice. <laughs> he says, so I advise you, buy gold from me. Gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. See, real riches are not the riches of this world. Real riches are eternal riches or spiritual riches. And real riches are found primarily in a relationship with Christ. The psalmist put it this way in Psalm 73, 25. He said this, he said, God, I desire you more than anything on this earth. Even though they thought they were rich, Jesus said, you're spiritually poor. The real riches are spiritual and eternal. And it reminds me of a song that we sang, I guess, in the 80s. It went something like this. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing that I desire compares with you because you are amazing and wonderful and awesome and you are the highest, right? That's who Jesus is. These people in Laodicea, they thought they had everything, didn't need anything, and therefore they lived their lives where they were self-sufficient. They were the Lord of their own lives and they didn't realize their desperate need for Jesus. 
because they thought they could take care of everything on their own, with their own resources, with their own intellect, with their own energy. And they realized that Jesus told them, hey, realize it. You can't do it without me. Can't do it. Then in verse 18, he continues to say this, hey, also, buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. And we know what the best clothes are. The best clothes don't, aren't purchased off of a rack or from a tailor in Laodicea or anywhere in the world. The best clothes is the white robe of Jesus' righteousness. And he's saying, look, you need my robe of righteousness more than you need what Laodicea produces or what the world produces. Be clothed in my righteousness. And Jesus goes on to say this. He says, an ointment for your eyes. He's saying, buy from me some ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. See, even though they have that eye salve, that ointment, Jesus is saying, look, you might be able to see naturally, but you, you have no spiritual sight whatsoever. And Jesus is saying, look, you got to realize this. The most important things for you to see are spiritual things. Even far above any natural thing that you can see, you need to have spiritual sight. And then in verse 19, Jesus says this, I correct and discipline everyone I love. Now, we live in a world that doesn't like correction. We live in a world that doesn't like discipline, right? But Jesus says this, I correct you and I discipline you because I love you. I want what's best for you. I'm concerned about your safety. I'm concerned about your eternity. I'm concerned about your well-being. And for him to just abandon us and not correct us and not discipline us would show that he doesn't even care. He just says, just go figure it out on your own. No, he says, I correct my kids and I discipline my kids. You know why? Because I love my kids is what Jesus says. See, there's no encouragement in this letter to the called out ones of Laodicea, but there is hope. Here's the hope. Jesus loves them. And his words of correction and discipline are proof of his love. Going back to verse 19, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Here's a word that's popped up all the way through the letters. Jesus is saying, look, you need to turn. The word that we've been looking at that means turn is repent. Be diligent and repent from your indifference from thinking that everything's okay, from enjoying lukewarm. You, you got to repent. You got to turn. You got to turn. Change the way you think. Change the way you live. And Jesus is calling them to repentance, just like he has almost every other church that we've been looking at. And then he says this, and it's a familiar verse if you've spent a lot of time in church. You probably heard it, but you probably heard it used out of context. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. So what is Jesus saying? I mean, I've heard hundreds of people use that as an invitation for people who don't know God. Look, I stand at the door knocking. I'm knocking on the door of your heart. Will you let me in? I want to be your Savior. I want to be your Lord. I want to forgive you. But that's not the context of what we're reading. Jesus is writing a letter to the church, to the ones who are the called out ones. And he's saying this, look, 
You've been, you've been going through these religious motions and I haven't even been there because you haven't invited me there and you're not honoring me and respecting me and, and, and depending on me. You're depending on yourself. So Jesus is saying, look, let me in. Let me be what this is all about because this is all about me and you've turned it into something else. I want to be in relationship with you. I want to have fellowship with you. I want you to know me. Right? He says, let me in. What did he say? I'll come in. If you open the door, I'm, I'm ready to come in and I'll share a meal together with you. We will have fellowship together and relationship together. And then in verse 21, he says this. Those who are victorious, and I ask you again, are you in Christ? If you're in Christ, raise your hand and say, I'm victorious. Because the ones who are in Christ, they are more than conquerors in Christ. And he leads us in triumphal procession. We are victorious ones. We are the victorious ones. Those who are victorious, Jesus says, will sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. What is that a picture of? Well, the ones who are in Christ, they are sons and daughters of the king of eternity. Wow. <laughs> and Jesus is saying, look, you, if you're a victorious one, you will sit with me. You are sons and daughters of the king. You are princes and princesses of the king. God is not only our father, he's the king of all eternity. And we are his sons and daughters and we rule and reign with him. We stand in his authority in this earth as his ambassadors, as his representatives. Speaking his word and representing his kingdom in this world. And then we end with the verse that we started with. Revelation 3.22 says, Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your word. God, I pray that we would receive your truth today and that we would examine our hearts and, and see if we are hot or cold or lukewarm. God, we want to know you. And we confess our need for you. We don't want to do even a moment of this life without you. So we surrender ourselves to you afresh today. And we want to know you and be in relationship and fellowship with you constantly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining with us today here at Elation Church, and thanks for being a part of our Elation family. If today's message was an encouragement to you, would you consider sharing it with all of your social media friends? I mean, it's so easy to just hit that share button right under the video. In doing that, you will be coming alongside of us in our mission because our mission is to bring good news of great joy to all people. We'll see you right back here next week at Election Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church. 